Hello fellow Star Trek fans, welcome back to this week's episode of Ten Forward, the episode and recap series brought to you as part of the Clone Star Pod. I'm your host Mike Overton and this week we're delving in to Star Trek Lower Deck Season 4 Episode 5. The episode is entitled Empathological Fallacies, but a quick word from our sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Sci-Fi.com, the one-stop galactic bookshop. Use discount code CLONESTARPOD at checkout and make sure that the currency is set to British pounds and you will receive 10% off any sci-fi books. That's it from our sponsor, let's delve into the episode. The USS Cerritos is assigned to transport a trio of Betazoid diplomats who are searching for answers about the elusive mystery vessel that we've seen throughout the season so far. Talin finds little favour in these Betazoid diplomats, dismissing them as glorified socialites, more interested in rivalry than reason. Captain Freeman strives to maintain her composure amidst the Betazoid's uncanny mind-reading abilities and their audacious advances. Tillin, a Vulcan of unwavering reserve, is tasked with tending to their every need, even though they are pushing the boundaries of decorum. As Tillin drafts a log to her former Vulcan captain regarding her frustrations about serving aboard the Cerritos, she yearns to send this message, but the ship is under a security blackout, leaving her communication efforts in vain. Meanwhile, Boimler grapples with learning every crew member's name and Rutherford intervenes, introducing him to the mysterious security team program led by Shax, only to discover that it involves rather unconventional activities. Tillin, desperate for answers, ventures to the party in order to search for the communication blockout ending. But what she witnesses is sheer pandemonium. The crew, including the ever calm Dr. Maliglimo, succumbs to unprecedented emotional outbursts. Talin suspects the Betazoid diplomats may be behind the turmoil, citing the possibility of Xanthi fever. The chaos intensifies, prompting Talin to take matters into her own hands. The Betazoids agree to move the party to sickbay, and after Dr. Ta'ana rules out that they are disrupting the crew, the Betazoids shed their facade and incapacitate the crew with lipstick stun buttons. The frazzled Captain Freeman relishes in, in her vindication, confident in her instincts. Cuffed and escorted to the bridge, Freeman uncovers the truth. The Betazoids are officers of the Beta Z intelligence agency on a secret mission to investigate these mysterious ship attacks. They aim to take the Cerritos back to Beta Z, ignoring the Romulan neutral zone. In a twist of fate, Talin discovers that she is the source of the ship's emotional turmoil, possibly due to Bendai syndrome something that Sarek suffered with in TNG. With Mariner's unorthodox guidance, she learns to embrace her emotions, calming the ship and the crew. The security team, once dismissed as mere game-playing, springs into action during the ensuing red alert, subduing the BIA officers. Captain Freeman averts disaster just in time, preventing entry into the neutral zone. Boimler, originally disheartened by the security team's unconventional method, learns that the values of their holistic approach is to protecting the crew. As the events draw to a close, apologies are exchanged and the BIA officers provide valuable intelligence on this mystery ship. Talin, with a newfound clarity, decides to remain aboard the Cerritos, embracing its chaotic ways. And so, the USS Cerrito sails on a testament to unpredictability of space and resilience of its crew, bound by logic, emotion, and in the pursuit of venture. This episode, although very good in parts, has one major flaw, and and that to me are the three Betazoids. Now, it, they, they've tried to make them like Luxana Troy, which I get, but at the same time, they haven't quite nailed it, and it's almost like they're trying too hard to be like her. 
So what you get is you get this kind of very fake, artificial um, kind of interpretation of Luxana. I mean, the thing that I loved about Majel Barrett's Luxana Troy is that she always came across as, although very pretentious at times, and especially on in TNG, very, I want to say boisterous to a point, it was always very genuine. Whereas here, it's 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 a poor, with my book, a poor facsimile of what she was. And I think that either the writing could have been a little bit better to match more, you know, sort of that more typical Luxana, or they should have put a different sort of spin on it. I don't know. I mean, if you look at the Troys as a whole, you compare Deanna with her mother. They are two very different people. Where here we've got three Betazoids that are almost identical. It, it's just very strange. And to me, it just doesn't fit well in this episode. I think a different kind of alien or a different kind of species would have fitted in better here. Um, so yeah, that's the only part of this episode I didn't like, were the, the three Betazoids. There's some really good parts of this episode and some really interesting little spoilers and some th things that I noticed that when Mariner and Talina are leaving the, the bar, the mess hall, um, they're being chased by a bunch of, well, a bunch of the crew. And one of the things that I noticed is one of the crew members is wearing that, that game that we see in TNG, and I can't remember the name of it, but it's those goggles that, you know, you have to get the cone in, into the grid. Um, yeah, which I thought was a fun little easter egg because I would have presumed that those things would have been outlawed bearing in mind their hypnotic control. Some really funny parts of this episode as well. I loved the Shax and Boimler dynamic this week as well. Um, it kind of really shows Shax's soft side which we do see throughout but he's always kind of a bit of a, you know, he's always got that bit of bravado around him. So it's really nice to see that, that kind of, I want to say, soft and cuddly bear side a little bit more which we don't get to see very often we just see the i want to jet the damn warp core shacks so it's nice to see the other side of him um yeah so just a good episode through and through other than the three betazoids so my standout moment this week is is the boimler shacks sort of subplot that we have here um, I love Shax. Shax is one of my favourite characters from Lower Decks. And, you know, we always see this kind of big bravado, you know, stern chief of security. And we know he has a soft side. We know that from the fact he does pottery, for example. You know, and the thing that really got to me this week was... After all of the events of the episode had kind of transpired and things were going back to normal... Boimler asks, you know, and Shax have a little heart to heart. And the thing that I really loved here is Shax pointed out that there's more to security in his eyes than just phasering people. It's about keeping everybody safe. It's about almost sort of keeping that family vibe going throughout the ship, whether that is mental health, physical health, um, whether it is, you know, tackling intruders and enemies. So it was really nice to see that side of Shax and I think that also falls true as well with with other heads of security that we've seen you know throughout Trek of past you know we see that to a point a little bit in Odo not quite so much but you know and we definitely see that with Worf as well we see that Worf has a little bit of a soft side to some people so yeah I just think it's it's a really nice take and a really nice spin and it just kind of puts that almost homeliness to to the episode. So yeah, my standout moment from this week is is the the Shaq and Boimler relationship, which I really loved. <coughs> Empathological Fallacies is a captivating bottle episode that kind of plays homage to classic Star Trek themes, such as compromised crew, hostile takeovers, and whilst focusing on breakout character to Lynn, the episode cleverly references past subgenres, immersing itself in rich Star Trek lore. 
Told from Talyn's perspective, the, the narrative carries echoes of Data's day, as she forges deeper connections with her crewmates by exploring her own identity. Talyn's evolution is reminiscent of Spock from the original series movies. Her iconic line of, I suppose, by the transistive property, I too must be Vulcan, as a m is destined to become the love Star Trek quote, and I hope it does. This season allows for Talyn to undergo a compelling sort of character arc as she questions her ambition to rejoin the Vulcan fleet. The subtle references to Vulcan art and suggestive of the early onset of the Bendai syndrome adds depth to her journey, although the latter is notably kind of a dark revelation. While Talyn's development is a highlight to me, it's worth noting that Tendi's character is at risk of being overshadowed, while her storyline, centering on seeking of Talyn's affection at times, kind of takes away from her character. This episode subtly weaves in this overarching theme of these mystery ship attacks that we've seen earlier in the season. This time, using a trio of Beta Z intelligent officers posing as partygoers on a quadrant tour. The episode effectively balances the ongoing season arc with episodic fun, keeping the audience without any overshadowing of the main story. Boimler's subplot exploring his struggles as a lieutenant and his journey into the security team is a nice additional, playing homage to the iconic security figures like Worf, Odo and even Malcolm Reed. The security team's modern perspective on safety and well-being reflects the core principles of Star Trek as a franchise. Empathological Fallacies captures the essence of Star Trek, whilst delivering an entertaining and character-driven episode that is sure to resonate with fans. Thanks everyone for tuning in to this week's sponsored episode by SciFi.com. Remember, you can use discount code CLONESTARPOD for 10% off at checkout on their massive range of Star Trek and other sci-fi books. Once again, if you'd like to catch up with more Clone Star Pod, you can tune in every Wednesday to the War Room or visit clonestarpod.com where there are blogs and fan art created by you, Star Trek fans, as well as links to our incredible merch. Once again, I've been your host, Mike Overton, and let's have a great weekend ahead. Yeah.